The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet. Today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of Future Proof. Your host here, Eric Cavanaugh, along with an all-star cast. But the star of the show is going to be Dr. Jeffrey Miloski. He is a PhD I've known for many years now. He spent many years working for the Department of Defense as a contractor. He cut his teeth at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. And we're going to talk today about the science of COVID-19. What's really going on out there? We'll do a roundtable discussion after this is done. But first and foremost, let me hand it over to Dr. Jeffrey Malofsky. COVID pandemic, what science and data really tell us? This is the executive summary. Dr. Malofsky, the floor is yours. We have to ask the question, why are we doing this review? Well, part of the first bullet is rather obvious. There's been a massive upheaval, an unprecedented upheaval in our society in all aspects of it, in health, obviously, because COVID is a virus, but also the economy. And so we see never ending stories about the brutal destruction of our national economy in an incredibly short time. And then we're also seeing uh, restrictions on civil liberties, which are unprecedented. So again, we're not being judgmental. This is the reason to look at this and make sure that we have a sober, very objective view of what's happening. The leadership and then everybody has stated their intent to follow science, but you have to ask the question, how well are they doing so? And the first part was when this fir first hit in this country and globally, the concern was that there was an initially predicted very high mortality rate and extensive infection throughout the population. Later research, as we get more in-depth in uh, knowledge based upon real cases and a limited amount of testing and what happened in uh, some of the early countries showed that the mortality rate was actually significantly lower than what was predicted and that the serious illnesses were confined to some very well-defined subgroups. Well, that's very interesting. So that's a good news story. But then what have we done about that? This led to draconian sheltering and economic shutdown. And a key concern there was the justification to do so. And we'll get into that. And then the economic cost is immense, as we said. And then there's a deep concern, which I'll share with you, that the science and data analysis is being inaccurately reported to both the public and the leadership. And they're getting an inaccurate report of the true science and the true data analysis, then obviously the decisions that they have to make with very hard trade-off concerns are going to be less than effective. And then in this type of review, the goal is to find potential errors. It doesn't mean that there are errors, but we're looking at it to see if there are potential errors in the science, in the data analysis, and in the management of both of those, and then in the communication thereof. This type of study is rigorous in that it avoids all emotion. It avoids all politics. We don't malign anyone, and we completely ruthlessly avoid banal platitudes and we just don't pay attention to non-experts. So this is really an expert view of the world. Breaking news, patients with certain cancers are nearly three times more likely to die. Well, guess what? It's not nice, but if you have advanced cancer, you're probably three to 10 times more likely to die of almost anything. Dust, uh, pollen, you know, being rear-ended at four miles per hour. The point is you're heavily infirm. So that's not really a good headline because it doesn't really convey an objective view of the world. One big issue that is really being misstated in the media is they keep talking about confirmed cases. Confirmed cases are what it says, but we also know that we have very little testing. So the confirmed cases <clears throat> are only those where the people have gone into the hospital and been tested, which means you're already predetermined a test population that is already very ill. It's not everybody out there. And so you have to be very careful about the statistics that go on with that. So on the left side, you see the active cases worldwide, the closed cases. But now look at the number in the lower left, 2.4 million in mild condition. So by the own numbers here, 98 percent 
of just the cases that we know about, and we have done very little testing, are very mild. 2% are serious or critical. And then we go on from there. In the US, using the Johns Hopkins data, which is one of the leaders for reporting what's happening here and throughout the globe, we have 9.6 million tested in the US, 1.4 million confirmed, and now look what those statistics show it down below. If you just do it off the confirmed cases, you have 6% fatality. If you do it off all the tested, that drops down to 0.9%. But we already know we've done very little testing, and so that ratio is a ratio of seven. We know from other ways that a reasonable increase of the number of people who actually have it to those would be five to 50 greater, so then you're talking about an infection fatality rate of 0.2 to 0.6%. And that actually agrees with the very original research projections that were going on. That makes it worse than the flu, which averages about 0.1%, but it certainly does not make it the bubonic flu. This is just unprecedented economic damage, which you also see in the lower right graph, which shows in one quarter we lost 5% of the GDP of this country. That's 5%. You don't see hits like this unless we're in a major global war. We're gonna flatten the curve because of limited healthcare capacity. So when I'm doing this review, I'm not judging whether they came up with the right justification. I'm saying based upon what they're saying, their own words, their own objectives, their own approach, have they really fulfilled that or is there something missing and if there's something missing, let's point it out and let's point out how to fix it as quickly as possible. So let's get to science. This is a, a important quote from Richard Feynman. And what's really important there is to look at the words utter honesty, a kind of leaning over backwards. You should report everything that you think might make it invalid, not only what you think is right about it. And that's critical to understand the science. So everybody, including Congress and senators and politicians and people in their homes and the neighborhoods who say follow the science, you have to get this. If you don't get this, you don't really grasp the culture of science. This is what it's all about. Science does not provide guaranteed conclusions. That's not what we do in science. We provide a body of very detailed ev evidence that has to be reproducible by other experts and then it gets vetted over a long period of time, science is set up for long-term review so that something we know uh, can be turned on its head later on. And this has happened many times in the history of science where established theory gets turned completely around as new information comes around. So what is COVID-19? It's part of the coronavirus large family. There's hundreds of them. They mostly stay in animals, only seven sick in people, Four of those produce very mild colds, like the common cold. Three are serious, and that was the first SARS in 2002, MERS in 2012, and now this current one. And one of the things I want to draw your attention to is look at those dates, 2002, 2012, 2019. Ten years, seven years. This is not a once-in-a-lifetime event. We are going to have epidemics of serious viral infections occur all the time. This is one of the first papers that dealt with the origin of this and whether or not it could be man-made or come out of a lab. And again, science does not give you a 100% answer. What it says is that it appears not to be man-made. It appears to not be purposefully manipulated. But new evidence can come at a later time and say, yep, now it looks, does look like that. But from this level of genomic analysis, where you're getting down to the crux of the chemistry, inside the nucleotides and the amino acids, how the thing reacts on the spikes attaching to a human cell. And this is comparing all this genomic data across this COVID to the previous one, to what's in bats, to what's in pangolin. It's a very good study. What is the rate of hospitalization? And here what we see is science tells us it's not equal. It's also not the flu. The flu could hit young people very hard. This COVID it's disproportionately hitting elderly and infirm. It is, it is effectively not hitting young people at all. So now contrast that to what you hear on TV news all the time, to what you hear in the media, which makes you believe that your babies and toddlers are gonna drop over dead in the park if they go on a swing. Not true. 
the effective rate of uh, risk to young children is pegged at near zero. Statistically, 10 children out of 300 million who get ill, even seriously, is negligible and not a concern. If you're 65 and over and you go to the hospital for COVID, it's because 94% had an underlying condition. On average, 89% have an underlying condition. That's a very important statistic. What are the symptoms? And they're mostly mild, except for that one subgroup of elderly and infirm. And how do we know that? Well, the CDC has a fact center on their website because there are so many rumors. And here's fact number two. For most people, the immediate risk of becoming seriously ill from the virus is low. It's only high if you have some of those underlying conditions which are listed below it, which are serious in and of themselves, though there is an unanswered question right now. If you go to the hospital with COVID, if you have an underlying uh, condition, is the death really COVID-19? That's how it's being related. Or is it really what's called comorbidity, where it's really the combination of the two? On the upper left, you see a very small sample, confirmed only. So that's not everyone infected, that's confirmed. And even in the only the confirmed cases, 81% are mild. And then finally, in the bottom left is similar numbers. And then one epidemiologist saying, asking an appropriate question. And it's a question that's being asked. It's not saying what should be done. If, and I stress if, the results are representative, then we have to ask, what the hell are we locking down for? This is really statistics at the heart. And this is what it looks like the leadership and the public is not getting. A lot of the numbers being presented are all statistical, and the uncertainty in the core statistics is extremely high. There's different type of numbers being done. There's what's called the infection fatality rate, which as it says, it's the number of dead versus the number of infected. There's the case fatality rate, which is the number of dead versus the number of reported cases. That's what's being mostly reported reported in the media and mostly reported to the leadership. And that's not the number you want to use because when you're concerned about the population, what you really care about is the IFR. And if you ask a person on the street what those numbers mean, they're most likely going to say intuitively, they think it's on the general population. They're not. Those mortality rates you see being published are not general population rates. That's a big issue. Then you see the problem with the statistics that if you go down and look between countries, the fatality rates significantly, there's selection bias, et cetera. So what does this tell you? The virus is not different in Italy, Russia, or the US. So if the mortality rates change dramatically, that either tells you that your population is skewed heavily, and in Italy, we know it skews to the elderly, but not enough to make sense of it. What it tells you is that there's a really serious problem with statistics, and you don't use them as is. They might give you a guide, but they are certainly not hard numbers to use. They're looking at, on average, there's two numbers highlighted there. 95% confidence interval varies 25,000 to 91,000. That's just the statistical range. So they pick the number right smack in the middle, 54,000. And using that, that means the number of infected in Santa Clara County is estimated to be 50 times greater than what is known, which means that all those numbers, all those rates drop by a factor of 50, which means where's the justification? Comparing the case fatality rate for COVID-19, and that's the high number. Remember, 3% is only out of confirmed. That's not the rate of all infected. But compare it to some other known viruses, and you see that COVID-19 is not a killer virus confirmation information of that from a large-scale study in China, that distinction across countries, and you can see the huge variation. There's various type of models there. The most common one uses compartments to break up the population into various groups. Uh, one of the most general ones is called the SIR, susceptible, infected, recovered. What they do in the model is they define these time-dependent equations that relate how many are in each group across time, and then they make certain assumptions. That's critical. They're making a lot of assumptions because they have to, not because they want to, but because they have to. Those are called boundary conditions in modeling. Your result is exponentially dependent on the range of your assumption, really calibrating to real science. Prior studies have shown that these epidemic models did not do that well 
when looked in retrospect, in retrospect being like 10 years after the fact. So the current models have done some very sensible things. They've increased the number of compartments. They've modified the statistics to bring in new statistical capabilities. But because of that inherent uncertainty, that tells you that the parameters, the uncertainty is so high that you can't trust it to be accurate, but it gives you an informative guide. You're seeing all the parameters. On the right-hand side is the time-dependent differential equations, and that's great if you're used to the math. But what's there on the middle bottom are all the fitting parameters, and that's what they're called. You have to fit those to something. Otherwise, the numbers could be anything you want them to be. That's the problem. Bayesian statistics is an old form created by Bayes, and it has to do with probability called degrees of belief. So what you do is you take, uh, as you move forward in time, you take some of the known quantities, you put that back into retrospect on the older statistics, and you use that updated view to make new projections, or you're kind of improving on time but it does not guarantee accuracy. They take a bunch of models and they compute it and compare and contrast. They're calibrating as best as they can to what is known. So they're using the black lines for something called curve fitting, which is good, to reported deaths in the US, which is the red lines. And then they do something excellent, which is they really publish, without being forced to, the uncertainty in the results, which are those gray areas. So here was one of the first ones from Fareed Zachariah, who wrote this article in the post about, hey, these models were not trustworthy from day one, and no one hid the fact. Nobody in the technical community was hiding that, but it was not being reported. With media, we have a problem with getting some facts. Again, the CDC has this fact-based center here. So you look at some of these facts here. Uh, number two, we talked about before. Uh, number three, if you've completed quarantine, you do not pose a risk to somebody else. Looking at these headlines is not a good news story. They're sensationalistic. They misconstrue it. This is not objective journalism. It's not even journalism. It's headline creation. So here's one. Sweden says this coronavirus approach has worked. The numbers suggest a different story. The numbers they reference in this paper are these numbers on the right-hand side, which come directly from Johns Hopkins. So I call out Sweden. The number they specifically do is the last column, deaths per 100,000 population. So there's Sweden at 26. Well, certainly worse than Turkey, but look where it falls out. It's better than the Netherlands, and let's go up. It's much better than France. It's a heck of a lot better than Belgium. It's pretty close to the U.S. It's better than Italy. So where's the beef? This is inaccurate. This is completely wrong journalism. This headline should never have been published. As a scientist on the upper left, I'm putting my hand up, and all scientists out there, you need to do a stronger job of pushing back against these sensationalist headlines. That is the obligation we have as scientists. Everything's getting hit. It's not just the economy, it's extremism. We are now encouraging more violence because the opportunists out there who wanna kill people anyway, will now do it. Just look at the raid on the maternity ward where they killed mothers with newborns for gas leak. On measles, measles which was being vanquished, now we have a large population of children not getting measles, so measles will come up. And guess what? Measles kills. We're now creating more death, not, and so it can't just focus on the near term. We know that economic collapse kills people. From the financial collapse in 2008, 2010, 260,000 deaths came just from cancer, and that came in a published journal, The Lancet, and these numbers are coming from the World Health Organization. Who's really going to make that decision about who's worth saving? Are we saving immediate patients and condemning a larger number to die later? So you have to look at this from a total point of view, which is what this is saying. Science as a field requires you to take a full system perspective. That means you cannot look at a narrow slice of the world. You have to look at everything that happens in that. And so this is just a common sense total cost function that we created from known effect. So this is not academic question. This is not just let's save some lives now. Unfortunately, as a society, we have many other influences that we have to deal with. And then this leads to the findings. Uh, the scientists have done an excellent job in a rapid response mode. The modelers have done very good work, but I am chastising them as a group. You have done a poor job of communicating the inherent uncertainty and the high variability from the assumed parameters. 
and public. There's a widespread misunderstanding of science by politicians and public. Angela Merkel accepted because she is an actual scientist. And I know there's other ones in the political community. So you folks, I would request that you stand up, put your scientist hats back on, and don't just act as leaders for a moment, but act as scientists as well. So saying follow the science is absolutely meaningless. It is a bankrupt statement if you don't get the culture of science. So if you don't have uh, experience in science per se, please, please stop saying follow the science. That goes for the politicians as well. Uh, as a critical, so if I was doing this review, I would actually hit it as what's called a foundational failure because you're not using a total system of integrated cost over time. And this was what called formally, I would issue a critical failure note. And the ramification of that is the project would have to stop dead in its track. No more, no more management, no more public releases, nothing. The project management stops dead and would have to fix it immediately. And then as an important uh, conclusion, Science does not justify the continued lockdown because the basic assumptions are no longer true. And then Dr. Fauci is a wonderful person and expert. He really is doing an unbelievably great job, but he's acting as a medical professional, which means his primary concern is patient care, hence needless suffering and death. That's not how you lead a large organization. That's not how you lead a large, uh, that's not how you run your dry cleaner, if you're a mom and pop shop. That's not how you lead a corporation, and it's certainly not how you lead a country with many, many different facets. Science does justify using the knowledge that we have gained for selective isolation and monitoring. We know the vulnerable groups, and the good news is that they're pretty easy to identify, they're pretty easy to segregate, and we can bring resources to them. We can build out a distributed infrastructure to them, and then finally, the other major failure was using hospital ICU beds as the metric. That should never have been the primary metric. We can build distributed infrastructure. China proved that by almost overnight building multiple hospitals. So using that hospital ICU bed as the metric to flatten the curve was wrong. That was a significant error. It wasn't a critical failure, but it was a significant error. And then finally, I'll end with just this. This type of issue with senior management having hidden bias. Remember, this is not a ping on any single person. People are great, they're sincere, they're professionals, they're experts, they're trying to do their best, but they're humans. And human nature means that it's almost unavoidable sometimes to have some hidden bias or myopic management. And the Space Shuttle Challenger was that. The Space Shuttle Challenger blew up because of this. We've had many more failures from that, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Deepwater Oil, Boeing 737, there's many that happen because people are people. I want to get a comment from Richard Kirby. Richard, you spent 27 years at the United Nations working all over the Middle East and East Asia. What's your thought on the nexus or the intersection of scientific practice and policymaking as you've seen in this, uh, in this pandemic? Well, thank you, Eric, for giving me the floor. I think one of the, the major issues is that uh, unfortunately, politics always trumps science. And I think once you have the data you get from science, you can play around the data to get what you actually want to see. And I think what we've seen in, in many countries, uh, especially in, in the European and, and the Western countries, that people are putting a lot of emphasis on saving lives. And the, the question is, and it's a tough question to answer, when is a life more important than someone else's economic freedom? And that's a tough question, I think. And, and people and most of the politicians are taking the easy road out. So I'd rather save lives, like in the case of Dr. Fauci, which uh, Jeff had mentioned, save lives versus the economic uh, blowback that we're getting at this point in time. Put a lot of importance on the freedom to do things. And I think the more you have the lockdown in place, the more you're going to get that blowback from the average citizens who wants to go back to work, who says, look, because they don't understand the science per se. I mean, the science is being interpreted by the politicians, by the media. So therefore, you're not getting the real access. I mean, no one actually goes to the CDC website. There's very few people go to the CDC website to get the accurate information. You get it from what you see and hear on the news. So therefore, that changes your point of view. And I think the big caveat is, especially in the United States right now, because this is an election year, it makes matters worse. 
So now you have the left and the right trying to viable. They're, they're fighting to find who's got the right uh, mantle to talk about it. Who's, who's, who's giving them more information? Who's trying to go out there? So you have this kind of battle between the left and the right to try to take the mantle of who's, at, who's honest, who's not honest. Let's take the politics out of this discussion and let's bring jobs back to the countries. Yeah, and I, for one, believe there is a tremendous amount of damage being done to our culture, to our society. I was in New York just the other day for a medical procedure for my wife and talking to people in the park. People are saying, I'm never going to shake anyone's hand again. And I'm thinking that's really unfortunate because it, it seems to reflect on what I'm calling a bit of a cultural psychosis that we're going through because this is so bizarre. It is so intense. And uh, even if there are good intentions on the part of those who have put these lockdowns in place, nonetheless, we should remember the cliches that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I think Jeff has put a lot of good scientific information before us and reminded us that science does not provide absolute conclusions. It gives us a framework to better understand what's happening. And to your point, Richard, the political aspect of what we're dealing with here is really coloring and, and frankly miscoloring our ability to understand what's going on and make sensible decisions. And I'll bring Bob Garrity in as well, uh, as someone who focuses a lot on esports. You know, sports in general provide a great escape for people. They're expecting a 30% hit to GDP uh, because of this pandemic, which is absolutely breathtaking. But Bob, what's your take on the cultural impact of these lockdowns and how we've responded to this whole pandemic and especially how it relates to sports? What I've seen a lot of is, um... The, uh, as we take players off of the fields and off of the hockey rinks and out of the football stadiums and basketball courts, we see a diminish of the kids' activities, um, active activities, obviously. It's nice to see people walking outside in parks, and I've seen probably an uptake take of that, but uh, for almost all hockey and soccer, for example, I'm very engaged in those areas, there is no activity. And the kids are absolutely, players are just trying to get out on the field get on a hockey rink, get in a hockey rink, do something that they can stay active. So we have to have some sort of balance and that's uh, balancing all the positive things that we do in our life to make sure that we've got uh, a good balance of, of nutrition and um, activities with uh, social activities, spiritual activities or whatever it is. Can't have a trade-off that actually is negative to us in the long run. To Jeff's point earlier, when folks say follow the science, that's a bit misleading, right? Because there are scientific models that can be inaccurate. We see that all the time. Science, if we view it through the appropriate lens, we're going to get better and better at understanding. But to Richard's point, politics has so infused itself in this conversation. I, I don't know. We have a, a good uh, question from an attendee who's asking, uh, how could an average senior citizen help to influence the general public to be on alert for the biased viewpoints initiated by politicians and amplified by the press? What are your thoughts on how to get us back to a sensible perspective about how to approach this, Jeff? I would say the best thing you can do is uh, help communicate to younger people who I think are falling prey to the sensationalistic headline. Nowadays, you get a sensationalistic headline. People just make stuff up. You know, it's just to be entertainment. So I would say one of the things you can do is to convey to the younger generations that don't trust what you see on the headline. We should actually have a movement now, which is about this is really science. And it needs to counter, not as a naysayer, but it needs to counter as this is what science is objectively saying. Certain people have done a great job and we need a whole movement to say, you still decide what you want to decide, but this is what actual science is. I love it. Well, folks, this has been a fantastic inaugural episode of Future Proof. Hop online to insightanalysis.com for more information. That's where we'll post the archive. And this is going to be broadcast all around the country later this summer on public access stations. Folks, we want to know what you want to know. So if you have any thoughts about all this, send me an email, info at insightanalysis.com. That comes straight to me. And like I say, we're keen to understand what your impressions are. What are you seeing out there? We had some great questions from the audience today. Big thanks to Dr. Jeffrey Malofsky. Of course, big thanks to Mr. Bob Garrity and Richard Kirby as well. And you can hear Richard and I every week, one o'clock Eastern time on World Matters, broadcasting weekly. And of course, we also have DM Radio and Inside Analysis. We want to know what you want to know. Send me an email, info at insideanalysis.com. With that, we're going to bid you farewell, folks. We'll talk to you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.